Okay, so um, today I want to talk about Django's, Django and Django's ORM. Can I get a show of hands to a few in the room uses Django, has used Django in the past? Yeah, that's like good 50-60%. So when you use Django these days, or pretty much all the time, you, one of the key components you use is the ORM. Let me get some feedback here. And the ORM is one of the key components because it's rather nice to use, rather easy to use for a lot of things. But when you use the ORM, there's always like a bunch of gotchas that you get yourself into that might not actually work exactly the way how you think they work or where you're not entirely sure what actually happens under, under the hood. And today I want to talk about a couple of those gotchas, give you a couple of ideas of this is actually what's happening and here a couple of things in the ORM that you might not know about, that if you've used Django for a decade, then you possibly know, you hopefully know. If you haven't, then you possibly hopefully know afterwards and use that in your future. So with that, I want to give you a short introduction about myself. I'm Marcus Haltermann. I'm a contributor to the Django code for a couple of years, though I've changed over to the operational and security perspective um, for a few years now. And in my day job, I work as an engineer at Crate.io, which is the company behind CrateDB, a database for machine learning or machine data, sensor data so in the IoT world. Um, as, meant, as mentioned, we will talk about databases and database models and database queries. And I got to admit, there's a lot, going to be a lot of code on these slides. I don't expect you to be able to just read all of it and just completely understand it. I will have all the codes and the examples up after the talk. I'll publish a link on Slack, on Twitter, um, Twitter handle at the bottom. Um, so you can follow me there and can see the, the complete examples all there and can go through them in, in your own pace afterwards again if you want to. I want to start off with defining our database schema a bit that I'm going to use throughout this talk. And it starts off with an author, one of the typical examples, I guess, in a lot of Django projects and tutorials these days. Um, it's rather simplistic. It has a name. It, it, it serializes as a string when you, when you print it out on the command line. And that's pretty much it. Similarly, we have genres. And they, are look, they look pretty much the same. It's only difference. The name is unique, because it's like there's only one genre with that name. There's like, you can't have two action genres. And then the third thing, the third model we're going to use is a book model. And this has a bit more complexity and a bit more information in there. It has a title. It has a bunch of words or likes or whatever you want to call them. And then there's a reference to, a foreign, to, to the author. So one book has exactly one author. That might not be the, real th the thing in the real world, but that's our model we work with these day, today. And we have a many-to-many -many relationship to genres. So one book can have multiple genres. And we use those, this two difference between genres and, and authors throughout the code to give a bit of a uh, show a bit of a difference between how those relationships work. Great. Let's start off with something rather simple and something I bet all of you who use Django and have used Django before have done. And if you haven't then and have counted objects and you have done it differently, this is probably the way you probably should do it. It also shows how many objects we have in our demo set. And yeah, we have author.objects.count or book or genre objects.count. And what we see here is essentially the model on the left side and the count method on the right side in this example, which is a method defined on the so-called query set. The query set is the thing that transforms this abstract, I want to select something, something from the database into SQL with a bunch of stuff under the hood. But this is the place where when you do custom filtering operations and, and all these things, you're effectively working with query sets. The objects in the, mean, in the middle take care of the plural form objects because object is a Python keyword, or uh, not keyword, but a Python built-in thing. Um, 
it's kind of the, it's a model manager and combines like the model on one hand side and the query set on the other, and just links them together. By default, Django creates an objects model manager, but you can define your own ones that, for example, filter on only published posts or whatever your example is. And with that, let's keep going with like fetching a single object. So fetching a single object, the Django query set has a method called get. And when we try to do that in this example, author.objects.get, author Django is going to present us with a really nice exception. Because, well, we get multiple objects back. Because in fact, we have 1,142 authors in our database. So what does it actually tell us? Well, it tells us that you can't do this right now because this is, I want a single object back. Get expects a single object. What you can do instead, if you don't care, for example, which object you get, but only that you get one object or maybe none, you can use first. And that will, unlike get, return one or zero objects. If there is no, no object with certain filter criteria or whatnot, then it returns none. If there is one, it returns that one first object. If there are multiple, it returns the first one that the database returns. And we can see that in this example, for example, we filter on authors with markers as a name. Unfortunately, I haven't written any book, so there is no author with my name there yet. So first returns none. And get, on the other hand, says there is no object, no author with this filter criteria. Now we've seen a bit of filtering happening right now. And this is good for a lot of things and often sufficient for a lot of things. But there you will run into cases where you need more filter capabilities. And what we've seen right now or just before with the name equals something is an exact filter. So we're ex looking for a database column with where this field has exactly that value, which is often a thing you use, but not always. For example, we could look at records that have, that's where, where the name starts with a particular name value. And for that, we could use the underscore underscore starts with field lookup. The underscore underscore is the separator in, um, that Django uses between field names and, and lookups and transforms and all these kind of things um, to yeah, separate, essentially be able to separate them and chunk them and figure out what or where field name ends and whatnot. So in this query, for example, we filter for all authors whose name starts with Lisa. And then we get back a whole bunch of them. We can use I contains, for example, to I case insensitive to, to look for a string where we don't care about um, casing, so uppercase, lowercase, doesn't matter, and where the string somewhere contains the, the character sequence TOM. And well, that works exactly the same and to you anyway. You get back a list of, of authors. Under the, under the hood, I contains works different than starts with, works different than a whole bunch of other things that are out there. And this is the link where you can find the full documentation of all of those. So yeah, you don't need to like write off or write the link down right now. I'll publish the slides afterwards as well. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of these filter lookups on um, filter sequences that you can that you, that you can use and, and combine and, and do things with. And when we have the, or look at or think about our example that we have here with authors, books, and genres, we can, for example, follow related objects. And for that, let's take this example. We fetch all books, and then for the books, we, select, we want to print out the title and the name of the corresponding author. That's a great example, and this works, and that's what we want. But this is not really going to be efficient. It probably is fine for like two authors and three books. It's definitely not going to be fine when you have a bazillion authors and books, because what happens under the hood is Django is going to issue one database query for this, 
or rather when you start looping over the, or iterating over all the books. And then it's going to make one database query for every time you access the corresponding author. So, and essentially, number one query plus the number of elements in that query, which is not really efficient. You can see that when you're developing um, your Django application and you have debug equals true, in the connection of the corresponding database connection. So when you import the connection in your code and you print the queries, you see Django returns a list of dictionaries with like all the database queries it has, it has run so far. It's hugely if, uh, um, convenient when you, when you are in a debugger somewhere and like, actually let's double check what the database query was, like that happened, the last whatever 10 database queries that happened. This is a nice way to just like quickly check and not use database logging, for example. Now, as mentioned, this example we just had is not really efficient. We want something that's efficient because we have write applications and we should write applications that are efficient and nice to use and convenient to use and responsive and all these things. So we are following a one-to-one -one or one -to a many-to-one relationship here because on the other side of that relation we are following, there's one element, or at most one element anyway. And for that, there's this select related method on a query set. And yep, as said, select related you can use when the thing on the other end, on the, on the other end of your foreign key, of your relationship, is one or has at most one object. So we are on the book, and the book has one author, has a foreign key to author, so there's exactly one author on the other side, so you can use a select related. What that Django is going to do under the hood, it's going to create a database level join. Now if you turn the whole thing, the whole example around and want to select all the authors and then print the list of books for that author, something like this, then yeah, you can do that. But again, it's not really going to be efficient because again, you will do one query for the author, and then for every author you have, you will do a query for the corresponding books. So that's, again, in this case, possibly not that bad because we have less authors and thus less queries in total, but it's still not good. And now that we have had select related, there's probably something else out there that can be used there, and that's called prefetch related. Now, prefetch related works significantly different than um, select related. It works differently because instead of having just one database query than, um, as before, we now have two. We have one database query for the authors, so when we, we select all the authors, and the moment Django submits this or issues this, that query and gets the result back, it's going to issue a second database query with all the primary keys in there to fetch all the books that belong to those authors. And then Django is doing some internal handling of those books that it got from the database and the corresponding authors and just merges them together internally. So that's something that's happening, that's happening in the code and not in, um, not in, a soft, in, in data, on database level. So yeah, this is essentially the query Django is going to issue under the hood that you are not exposed to in that sense. But you can actually modify that query. And for that is there's this prefetch object. So when you use prefetch related, instead of just flowing in the string of the relation or the related name, you can use a prefetch object. You can, for example, annotate it with the same name, which is books here, and define a query set that Django is supposed to use. And in the example here, we just filter on books whose title starts with H, for whatever reason. And Django, instead of doing this query, it's going to add a filter by, or it's going to also add the filtering constraint that we had here. Okay. Who's still with me? Good. Um, let's keep going with aggregating data. And we have done some counting before, so how about we count again? But instead of counting just the number of um, number of authors or books or whatnot, we actually count related objects. 
And for that, Django has a thing called annotations or annotating database queries. And what that is going to do is it's going to do database level join as well and use database level aggreg aggregation functions. And then because of how the whole SQL thing works, we can have the corresponding um, book count as part of an, of an attribute on the author. And this is effectively the SQL that Django is going to gener generate here. So we select the author ID, the author name, and we select the count on the, on the ID of the related books as some, some name, and we do an outer join here because that's the right thing to do here. And then we group that whole thing by the author ID and name, so we have that, like the proper counting. This is how SQL works. Now, we can do something else. We can't just code, uh, count, we can also sum. So let's sum this, sum this up, this example. And yeah, let's, what we do here is we build the sum of the, all the votes on the books that belong to a particular author. And then coming back to the things we talk, just talked about, we can do, for example, an ordering by the whole sum that we just combined in decreasing order, so with this dash in the front, and then I only print out the first five elements. So with that, we get the five authors that have the most votes across all their books. Does it make sense? Good. Not too many, okay. Um, hopefully the next one's better. So yeah, this is the data, the SQL Django is going to generate for you, for those of you who, are, who might be interested in, in that. Now, I mentioned the annotation here, and I mentioned count and sum, and those are two like database level aggregation functions. But there's more to it, and there's more things that you can annotate. And this is an arbitrary example that I'm going to show. It does not necessarily mean it makes a lot of sense, but it's not necessarily, I'm not going to say this is really, really readable, but that's also partly because of the formatting on the slide and get the code on the one slide. What I'm doing here, and let's take this from the inside out, I find the first, the, the position of a string in the name column on a, on a database record. Then I subtract one from that position, and then I build the substring on the name com com um, column from the first character, because SQL starts with counting at one, like everywhere, um, to that position, and with that we get essentially the, let's call it first name, in quotes, because first name is a weird concept. Um, so we can then annotate the author with this substring expression and also um, add like the book count and what we get back is in this case, again, a query set and it doesn't look like anything else, like differently than what we had before because that's just the representation of how the whole thing works, the whole representation of the, the, the object in Django because of the string method we defined in the beginning. But we can use something like dot values. And here we annotate or we, we effectively group by or aggregate on the first name that we annotated here. And then we get back, well, still a query set, but a, um, a query set with dictionaries in there. And they have the first names on the one side and they have the book count on the other. So instead of having like a thousand or whatnot author records here, we possibly have just a couple of hundreds because there's definitely a couple, going to be a few authors versus sharing the, first, the same first name. And there's a whole bunch of, let's call it weird behavior and interesting behavior and confusing behavior around when and where you put values and how that implies or have effects on this query set you're generating. And because that's such a big topic and such a conf partly confusing topic, there's a whole like section in this documentation about like all the itsy bitsy tiny details on what you can do and can't do and like how this behaves and like this is going to be out of scope for this talk. So please look the values behavior up on this slide. Now the last topic I want to approach is some uh, common problem in 
in a lot of uh, situations, finding the top k elements from a list for something else or in relation to something else. So let's find the top three books by votes written by an author. Sounds easy, right? Sounds like for every author, we, we pick the top three books and then just be done with it. Yes, we can do that as in the very beginning without prefetching. And we are probably going to be fine, except for we have too many database records. So this is not going to fly. This is not going to be a solution to that. And top case selection is actually a problem in a lot of database, in, in a lot of SQL databases. It's not necessarily trivial to solve. And yeah, we may start off with something like this. So we have the books, we prefetch the, uh, this is the example we had in the beginning with, with author and prefetching books. So we can maybe order by votes in descending order and then take a slice, like only the top three, construct the whole prefetch thing and we get an assertion error from Django back because we do some slicing on a thing that we use into, in somewhere else. And, this is not going to work. We need something else. And that is something that's new in, I think, Django 2.1 or 2.0 uh, called subqueries. And subqueries are something that Django submits, like, or that, that uh, is a query that is run as part of a different query in your database. That's something the database takes care of. It's a bit, I guess, confusing to define because on the one hand side, you define a subquery with a different, like the subquery object with a, some query, um, query set. But then the query set you define has this outer reference object in there, which essentially just references some value from outside the actual query that it's running in. So when you try to run this query here, the book sub QS by, on its own, it's going to not work because it has an unresolved reference to something else. But running it as part of this query here actually works. And then we can add a whole bunch more code and do the, at the, the, the um, have the book query set as before. We have the books, uh, book sub query set, sub, sub query query set. We have the books query set, which is sub query. And then we can put this books query set into the prefetch object. Okay, this is confusing, I know. Um, it took me a while as well. Um, but what you can do here is that we then do what we did before. We iterate over the authors. We iterate for all the authors of our books because that's, we call it books here. This is the same. And then print out the title and get a list of, for all the authors, top three books they had. Okay, the that sample set is a bit screwed up here, but that's fine. Now, this is a SQL Django is going to generate. There's the sub, well, this is the SQL for the subquery. This is not the query for the selecting all the authors. But we have the subquery here. So we select the ID, we select only the ID for the books because that's what we decide here. We limit it to three. We group it by, we order it by votes in decreasing order and here we have the reference to the our author ID in the, from the author, author query set. And the author query set has the filtering that we initially saw on the author ID in here as well. And with that, we get the top three books per author um, and can print it out efficiently in two database queries. Now, this was a foreign key relationship between all, uh, books and authors. <laughs> we have this other relationship between books and genres. And it looks pretty much exactly the same with one minor difference, and that's distinct here. Because of the many-to-many -many relationship, we may get duplicate results. We don't want duplicate results, so we add distinct and where that duplicate records or, or rows are expunged are not part of the query set. And we got a whole bunch of, um, of SQL. Great. Thank you. Uh, 
I guess we have time for Q&A. Yeah, there's plenty of time. Uh, the question with the most upvotes, uh, do you have favorite real-world examples where a tiny change in code resulted in huge performance, performance optimizations? Um, yes, I do. Um, I have actually two examples. One sec. So the Django Users Project, which is a, like a German support platform for Ubuntu, uh, the Ubuntu users.de, they back in their days ran on like this, this very, very, in the very, very beginning was this PHP and um, I think Moin Moin Wiki and like a bunch of services combined. That was at some point not maintainable anymore and it was made, they made a decision to write, rewrite the whole thing themselves using Django. That was Django 0. Point, possibly even before first official Django release. And there were a bunch of, the thing, it was working, but there were a bunch of things where it was not really efficient. For example, selecting posts in the uh, bulletin board, in the discussion forum, for threads with a couple of hundred slides or uh, pages. And the solution that they came up with back then was to not just like select the corresponding page from the objects, but actually select all the primary keys for this thread then do the slicing in Django or in, the, in your application knowledge check and finding out which primary keys to, to use and then fetch the corresponding objects and deal with them. Um, that made, I, yeah, that was before the time I contributed there, but that was a huge difference um, and was far more efficient. The second example I have is from a um, job I had a couple of years ago where they had this huge, form and nested form sets and whatnot that possibly took like a minute or something longer to render and like the page took like ages to load and to render and submitting was even worse. And when I actually started looking into figuring out why and like how to optimize it, we ended up with like, I think the first number I, I saw were like 4,000 database queries. Um, on a rather big database, ta um, database as well. And after like, I think two days or so, I brought it down to like 50 or something and the page loaded in a couple of seconds, which was far more, far nicer experience. So yeah, this is, reducing the number of database queries can have a huge impact. Thank you. In the, in the get many items exception example, uh, the string ends with uh, 1142 exclamation point one. Uh, Wait, is the trailing one intentional? Sorry, once again. Which one? Sec. Um, ah, there. That. Uh, trailing one. Uh, no, it's not. Spelling mistake. Thank you. <laughs> um. Okay. Why doesn't Django support composite foreign keys? Because nobody implemented them yet. <laughs> Sounds if like an invitation. To, <laughs> go ahead, please. There's like, I'd like to say seven attempts of implementing them and they all failed for whatever reason. Like from not enough time to this is in the, the wrong approach or not a approach that's going to work across databases. Like this, like the whole spectrum. If you have the time to actually do this, it's probably not going to be something you can do in the, probably in a week. It's probably more like a couple of months, possibly. I don't know. Um, we are not objecting having it. It's just that nobody actually has done it. And same goes with the, um, yeah. So the, 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 the requirement for composite foreign keys are composite primary keys. And once you have them, you can go and have composite foreign keys. And yeah, there's a bun There's a couple of things that are actually already there um, in place that I saw a couple of days ago, but by, by chance. Um, but yeah, if you're up for that, by all means, knock yourself out. It's would be nice to have. Marcus, would you like this opportunity to make a plug for for DjangoCon Europe or and and, and its sprints? And if you if you're joining DjangoCon Europe, yes, definitely. There's uh, there's going to be sprints there. There's going to be 
uh, people there who know part, uh, details about the ORM. So that's a good place to, to talk to them and get ideas or feedback. Um, yeah. And please do come. There's usually only one or two people from Slovakia. So, um, so, so do show up if, if, if you can. Um, another one, top three by author. Uh, this is from a person with a nickname, Crutch. And um, what, if, what if I want all books that have top three votes? Some books may share the same uh, count of votes. Can you do window functions with, uh, in Django or ORM? What if I want all books that have top three votes? Windows may have the same. Yes, so you can do window functions in Django since 2.1, I think. Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, to be honest. So yeah, you can do window functions in Django. If that's the question, I hope that's answered. Yeah. Okay. Another one. In what areas is Django ORM better than SQL Alchemy, and where would you use uh, SQL Alchemy or a different alternative instead? I think the Django ORM is more approachable to beginners. Being built into Django, if you start off, you, you start off with like this one thing that's all together. Where you have the full request HTTP, like the the full thing there. It's feels to me a bit more in place and a bit more um, adequate for the for the whole concept of building this whole framework that does all the things in, in, that you need for web um, or web backend web and web development anyway. Um, SQL Alchemy can be, I think, more confusing, more complex because you can also do a whole bunch more and more, be more explicit on how you want a particular join to work, for example. Um, I don't think this, like, if you if you started with SQL Alchemy, this and you understand, it, and it's fine. You can use it. There's no no necessary reason to to switch. If you come from Django and need to use SQL Alchemy, it can easily feel like confusing. There was this talk yesterday morning um, where they showed like this. What was it? Something dot attribute name small or something some number like this is Python magic overwriting operators in that sense, but it's not actually magic. It's you can overwrite it, and it's I think it's a legitimate use case they make there. Django's underscore underscore something can be confusing as well if you don't know what it's me what it means. If you don't remember how those lookups are called, then Maybe just having the operator there is more approachable and more friendly, maybe. So yeah, this both are fine to use, both are both are doing their job and yeah. Okay. Um, how often do you use values instead of returning model objects for performance reasons? Seldom. Not that often. The, the, I, I think the the, um, the thing I use far more often is values list um, because I know I want this particular set of attributes, and I, when I know them, I possibly also don't care about the keys because I know the key, order in the keys, and I can have can have just add, uh, tuples coming back, or even with a flat equals two that's in there. If I just want a number, the list of IDs of something of, of some field, then I can throw in the flat equals to, in, to values list as well and get a effectively a list of values back. So that's, I think, something I use more often. And let's see about, about the last one. What is the craziest or unusual use of Django ORM you have seen and how was it interesting? Gosh, there was a talk at DjangoCon Europe a couple of years ago. Um, somebody showed a I gave a talk about um, how they are using Django in their client application. Like they had this, I think it was a Windows application, like native with Windows UI thing, and they ran some Django locally that was talking to some database. And like, okay, you can definitely do this. It wouldn't have been my first choice, but also I'm not necessarily the the 
and developer for like end user applications and in, in, in Windows or whatnot. So I don't actually know if there's better options out there. I, I suppose, but um, that was an interesting use that I've not seen before and not seen after ever since. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marcus. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>